Support for this podcast comes from Invent Together. I bet you didn't know that inventing activity by black inventors peaked in 1899, and it has never recovered. Black and Hispanic college graduates patented half the rate of white college graduates. That's just one of the reasons why you need to know about Invent Together. When our patent system gets more diverse, our nation will get stronger and more successful. Find out how you can help diverse inventors and unleash economic opportunity at inventtogether.org. For the Athletic Podcast Network, this is The Update. I'm Adam Copeland. On today's show, we'll talk to Marty Lurie, who covers the San Francisco Giants. You can hear him every weekend before Giants games on KNBR, talking baseball with Marty Lurie. No better guy to pick his brain about how the first half of the Giants season went, how the second half may go, and maybe even some all-star game memories. All things we can talk to with Marty Lurie, who joins me next. Today is Friday, July 9th. Always love welcoming Marty Lurie to the podcast. You, of course, can hear him on Talking Baseball before every Giants weekend home game on K... Not home game. Before every Giants weekend game on KMBR. Marty, now that the uh, the public house is open, I just start thinking about home game weekends with you, man. It's it's great to be back at the ballpark full capacity. Uh, How are you, man? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. It's a great time of year to be a baseball fan, let alone a Giants fan. And the fans are coming out to the ballpark. It's a whole different feel. And this is the way baseball should be. So we've got a beautiful two and a half months ahead of us. This is what baseball is all about, a pennant race. You know, we talk throughout the offseason and we talk throughout the year and and we talk weekends uh, before the ball games. But I know everybody's surprised about the Giants. I know nobody thought they would be here. But when you pull back and you look at this thing, from the depth of the organization to the injuries they face to, to the way Gabe Kapler has sort of learned on the job, How impressed are you with what Farhan Zaidi, Scott Harris, and Gabe Kapler's staff have done just from a a building a franchise up from where they were in 2019 when he took over? Well, very impressed. Really, very impressed. Their methods are really outstanding. And it all started really with the hiring of Gabe Kapler. We didn't know what that was going to bring. But he and Farhan get along well. They're on the same page. And then they went out and hired like 27 coaches. (laughs) And uh, really an analytical staff. And they put Ron Wotus in the middle of that to, you know, to balance everything off. And they really created an importance of the analytical part of baseball and how to get the most out of your ability. So the key was to get players who could do that. And that, to me, is the most amazing part. We can figure out what baseball is all about today. You don't want to walk people. Uh, You want a good strikeout rate. If you're a hitter, you don't want a high strikeout rate. You want a good fly ball rate. Uh, You want a good launch angle rate. We know all the things you want. But the most impressive thing for me is that they went out and got players who can do it. And that is really amazing. And look, the starting pitching, we had no idea going into this season. You know, Gosman, you know, he had a nice year last year. Di Sclafani did not have a very good year. Wood was coming off an injury, in fact, was injured to start the season. Cueto was coming back from an injury. Logan Webb really was all over the place last year. We had no idea what the pitching was going to be like, but when you look at the starting pitching now and their records, I think, and I looked at it this morning, I think it's something like 31 or 32 and 14 (laughs) as a starting staff, and that's just taken four of them. So they're close to averaging eight wins per pitcher heading into the break here. So to answer your question, I'm very impressed, and I'm more impressed that they got players who can make it happen. And there are good days ahead, I will tell you that. You're absolutely right about getting players that make it happen because we saw Farhan try to get like the versatility of the roster going, even under Bruce Bochy. We saw it in the 2020 short season where you want guys with options. You want to be able to move guys up and down. We've seen it more now than ever, except that it doesn't feel as inconsistent or rocky because to your point the guys they bring up Vossler's had some big moments this year Lamont Wade has been an absolute find even Jalen Davis who landed back on the IL this week had a couple of big plays a couple of nice diving plays in the outfield over the last week or so so it brings me sort of to the to the deadline question right and we've talked about this over the last few weeks and at any point of this season I think you could have said, well, maybe it's bullpen help they need. Maybe it's right-handed bat. Maybe it is that fifth starting pitcher. Is there an an element of the team that you identify? Because you're talking starting pitching has been great. The bullpen, I think, has been fairly consistent. I know maybe you want a a legitimate closer at the back end, but Jake McGee has been fine for the last few weeks, and 
even at the start of the season. What do you look at as, as a key need for this team if they really want to compete for a championship and not just get into the dance? Well, I think they could use another pitcher, another starting pitcher to take some pressure off of Gosman and DiSclefani and Wood. Now, of course, if you get into the playoffs, you don't need five starters. But another solid starting pitcher could be a good reliever, and that could be the right-handed reliever you're talking about. I'm not sure they need anything, to tell you the truth. I think the platooning that he does, they work it. They don't chase. You can watch these games, and uh, they don't chase out of the strike zone. And I'm not sure that they want to break this up. They've got Dickerson. They've got Ruff. They've got that platoon. And they're going to get Longoria back. They're going to get Belt back. Posey is going to come back. Crawford just does not slow down. I mean, he's having really just a, not only a career season for him, a career season for a shortstop. And the best season ever for a franchise shortstop for the Giants. I'll tell you honestly, if you tell me they're going to get in, and I think right now they've probably got about an 85 to 90% chance of getting in. If they are going to get in, I'm not sure you need to bust this team up, whether it's Estrada coming up or Solano at second base or La Stella coming back or Posey behind the plate with Casale. I think this is it. I think this is the team they love. And I don't see them breaking up this team to add one player that they don't know because they got to vet everybody over the winter. They got to bring in the pitchers that they knew. They told these pitchers, look, this is what we do. This is the way we do it. If you do what we say, you're going to be successful. So how do you go out in midseason and bring in someone you don't know into the clubhouse? I think it's a risk. And I don't think they have to do it. So... It may disappoint the fans, but my opinion is they've got enough. They've got enough, as you say, Adam, to win uh, and get in. Mm -hmm. Do they have enough to win a World Series? It depends who the opposition is because you look at the Dodgers. They're falling apart. Their starting pitching is falling apart. They've had so many injuries. You look at the Padres. Their starting pitching is just abysmal right now. The Mets, they can't hit a lick. They can't do anything. The Brewers don't hit a lick. They've got a couple of good starting pitchers. That's what they're built on. So I think that they can win the National League with what they have. Every point you make is great there, Marty. And who'd have thought heading into the All-Star break when we're talking about the Giants that they might be the most balanced team across baseball? You mentioned the, the, uh, the Dodgers struggling right now with their starting pitching. I think the Clayton Kershaw news of him landing on the injured list, yeah, they're heading into the break and they'll get a little extra time with him off. But I think that's a big concern for them. When you hear elbow strain or elbow inflammation and then it morphs into forearm inflammation, that's when you start thinking, Tommy John, that, that can't be good for the Dodgers down the stretch here. No, they have two legitimate starters right now, and that's Walker Bueller and Urias. That's it. Uh, May is out. He's had uh, Tommy John surgery. Uh, Kershaw, like you say, has the elbow inflammation. That's not good news. I don't think we're going to see Bauer back this year. I just don't think that's going to happen in light of this whole investigation and where MLB is and where the Dodgers are as an organization. And I think they're very vulnerable, and they still haven't hit – with that power that we think they've got. Bellinger is not hit at all. Seager still is not back, and they say he's really had a couple of setbacks along the way. Betts has not gone wild. Uh, Muncie has been terrific. Turner has been terrific. But then you're getting down to the Will Smiths of the world and McKinstries and the Pollocks of the world. Dodgers don't scare me as much anymore. The Padres have to go out and get a couple of starting pitchers. They do. Chris Paddock gets walloped by Washington on Wednesday night. Just just completely walloped. Musgrove can't get past the fifth inning. Darvish has been terrific. Weathers is not the same pitcher he was earlier in the year before he had the arm injury. They need a starting pitcher, and they're going to probably go out, and I think they know it because they've got a good offense, and they've got the most exciting player in the league in Tatis. And Machado, when the money's on the line, I think he'll, he'll come through. But they're going to need a couple of starting pitchers. So I think the Giants are in decent shape. I really do when you look at the competition. And I think that's the focus of what I'm going to say this weekend and what I'm going to say heading into the uh, the break and after the break. Let's see what the rest of the league can do, and then let's react to that.
This episode is brought to you by Verizon Visa Card, a credit card built right. You'll earn rewards when you shop at Verizon, but you'll earn even more for everyday purchases. Then use rewards at Verizon, or on travel, or to get gift cards from your favorite brands. It can help you save on your wireless bill, too. This is the credit card built for the way you live. This is Verizon Visa Card. To apply, visit verizon.com slash Verizon Visa Card. Subject to credit approval. Terms and conditions apply. See the Verizon Visa Card rewards terms and conditions in the application for details and restrictions. This episode is brought to you by Sweet Northwest Cherries. So you're at the grocery store or online and you're thinking, cherries. You know they're delicious. But did you also know that Sweet Northwest Cherries are loaded with phytonutrients? They can help you sleep better, reduce stress, and recover from exercise faster. Plus, they're low glycemic and packed with antioxidants. Learn more at nwcherries.com slash sweet health. It's so funny with the Padres, you mentioned them needing some starters. That's got to be frustrating for their front office. They've made trades for three starters over the last season. They went out and they got Mike Clevenger, then he misses this entire season. They trade for Blake Snell. Uh, He hasn't been as advertised, uh, at least to this point. And then, as you mentioned, Hugh Darvish, who's been fantastic, but they thought they were all set. I think they thought they had their rotation, they had their lineup, and uh, it shows you what the 60-game season didn't show us. It's a war of attrition. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So uh, they've got an uphill battle in the second half, but I can't let you go, Marty, without talking a little bit of all-star game. It's one of my favorite events every year. I'm a baseball junkie. You know that. I love baseball history, but the all-star game for me, I love that it's on a stage of its own. It's on a Tuesday night where nothing else is going on in the sports world except for the all-star game. It's just always been one of the special nights for me. Your all-star game memories or your thoughts about the all-star game, I think number one for me is that the fact that it doesn't count, that it doesn't determine home field of the World Series is a win uh, from here on out. But but what do you think about the all-star game when, when it comes to mind? Well, it's still fun. The baseball all-star game is the only all-star game that is actually a competition. Uh, So I I think you you start from that. And you just love to see, and I know they're going to have these sterile uniforms this year. The first all-star game in 1933, the National League did the same thing. It only lasted one year, and then they started wearing the uniforms of of the individual teams. But the introductions are fun. The matchups are kind of fun. It's just a a good evening. It's a feel-good evening for baseball. And you're going to get to see the stars of baseball uh, on the field in a game that's actually a game. It's not the NFL uh, Pro Bowl with uh, no blitzing. It's not the NBA uh, with, you know, just dunk after dunk after (laughs) dunk. It's an actual baseball game. And they have fun with it. So I I think it's terrific. Uh, My memories of the All-Star game, really a lot that I've read about, uh, you know, the Carl Hubble striking five out in a row right, right. in 1934, you know, with Ruth and Gehrig and Fox and Simmons and Cronin, uh, Fernando and Gooden in San Francisco in 1984, striking out six in a row between them. Uh, Willie Mays taking over the All-Star game. And as Willie has told me before, Alston would come up to him and say, Willie, help me with the lineup. And Willie would say, all right, I'm first, Aaron second, Clemente's third and do it else, whatever you want for the rest of it. <laughs> I don't care. It doesn't matter. And that, you know, and that's the way they approached it. Ichiro with his expletive, uh, you know, speech right. uh, to the American League. He's the last guy to talk. Uh, and he would say, F the National League, you know, something like that. And they'd go nuts and run out <laughs> of the clubhouse. The league presidents used to come in and, you know, and make arguments and, you know, the All-Star game is just, uh, it has so many injuries in it. Uh, you had Ted Williams uh, fracturing an elbow in 1950. You had uh, Dizzy Dean getting hit on the, on the toe by a line drive in the late 30s that effectively ended his career. You've got so many... Fossey things. and Pete Rose is one that Fossey comes to mind. Fossey and Pete Rose yeah. are very good. Absolutely. Ray was going to be one of the great young catchers in the American League until, until Pete Rose separated his shoulders. So you have, you know, you have such a good history, late inning home runs by Stan Musial, Red Shandings, you know, the first African-American players to play in the All-Star game in 1949 with Big Don Newcomb and Jackie and Campanella in Brooklyn, Very what true. that must have been like yeah. that day to be part of that, to see that. You know, you could go back, uh, Tony Perez hitting the home run in the 15th inning in Anaheim. Bo Jackson hitting the home run off Rick Rushell in 1989 while Ronald Reagan was on the air with Vince Scully. Uh Uh, You had that to to fall back on. 
there's just so many that go back and forth. Uh, the bonds getting what, robbed by up? is Tory Hunter. I think Tory Hunter. The home run. I think right, that was right. the year of the tie, wasn't it? Right. That's right. The Milwaukee, yeah. you know, and he lifts him up, and you know, and, and goes off. You have John <laughs> Cruck and Randy Johnson. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. it reminded me of you know Norm Cash going up there with a table leg yeah. and trying to hit Bob <laughs> Gibson. You know that sort of thing. So. It has so many moments that other sports don't have. Yeah. I, I challenge anyone to give me a highlight moment of an NBA All-Star game or an NFL game. But with baseball, we can take every one of these games and go back and find some highlight moments. And there are issues now. DeGrom doesn't want to go. Gray is not going. This was a big deal. Hank Greenberg wasn't played one year. Joe McCarthy didn't play him. And he said, you know, I'm not coming. I'm, uh, he said, I'm going to say goodbye to the All-Star game. Didn't show up the next year. Bob Feller didn't want to pitch a couple of years. And there were big issues in around the country in baseball. you got to play. That's what a big deal it was. And we're going to see a lot of players now opting out of the game. So to answer your question, it's really a great question because there's just so much that we love about baseball. And it goes back to the first home run ever hit. In 1933 by Babe Ruth, of course, who else would? The All-Star Game was put together uh, because of the Chicago World's Fair, that they wanted to make a big deal about it. The owners didn't want it. They were afraid of injury. They said, gee, if we do this in Chicago, other cities are going to want it. There's been elections of how players are elected in the 50s. The Cincinnati Reds sent in a billion votes, you know, a (laughs) a million votes for their whole team. And they all made the team to start. And Warren Giles said, no, I'm sorry, we can't do that. And he put the regular, you know, National League team out there. So there's so many great stories uh, about the All-Star game that I I know I'm going on and on about it. But this is what this game means to me. And I think it's just something that uh, we'll have a highlight that we're going to remember. And it's going to be a lot of fun. Well, that, Marty, that's why I asked you, because it's such a special day to me. I love the uh, the pageantry of it, and that's so much of what baseball is, right, and, and the tie to American history, and it's such a great summer Americana thing that we get to experience, I think, every year. And so, you know, I guess the only bummer there was you couldn't give me any good memories, Marty, of, uh, of All-Star games there. Well, I loved Stu, all of those. Stu Miller, yeah. Stu, Stu Miller, you know, the gust of wind yeah. that knocked him off the mound. Right, right. But I think if he has a, an All-Star memory for me, is Willie Mays. Yeah. And I saw the games, and I said to Willie, you know, look, I lived in Florida at that time. I didn't see Willie play every day. And I said, were you any good? <laughs> and he says, well, did you ever see the All-Star game? And I said, yeah. He says, well, take a look at that. And I remember back to watching the All-Star game. He would triple. He would score runs. It, it just didn't matter. He took over the game. And that's the memory that I have uh, of the All-Star game is Willie Mays taking over the game. And that's what I remember. Well, and it's produced one of the all-time great quotes that you can see on the concourse at Oracle Park. They invented the all-star game for Willie Mays. And I think it was Ted Williams said it, right? Wasn't he the one? Oh, it, it's just, it's great. It really, look look at Williams. He fractured his elbow in 1950, you know, going into the wall, yeah, a, a yeah. cement wall at Comiskey Park. There was no padding. Unbelievable. And he went to catch a ball and he, and he fractured his elbow and it cost Boston the pennant in 1950. So as I say, that's a question when someone asked me, I said, boy, that's a lot of fun. And I look forward to Tuesday. I really do. And I look, how about Sandoval in Kansas City? Yeah, I was I there mean, for that, that one, Marty. I was in the ballpark for that one. At, at Kauffman Stadium. It was, a, it was a bases loaded triple off of Verlander, and then he gets him twice in the World Series. How cool is that? Yeah. Well, how about that? But there were others in the Giants in that. In that All Star game, I think Kane and Posey thing. started, and Melky yeah. won the MVP. It was all. It was also this was such a great All Star game, 2012. Uh, this is the, actually the only one I've ever been to. It was also Bryce Harper and Mike Trout's first All Star game. It was Chipper Jones' final All Star game, and at the moment, I had thought it was going to be the last game Tony Larusa ever managed because he had won the World Series in 2011 and came back in 2012 to to do the All-Star game, but here he is back again with Chicago, so that was not the case. Well, it, it may have been the last game he managed. We don't know what he's doing <laughs> We don't know right who's managing now. these now, yeah. We just don't know what's going on with the White Sox right now. But, yeah, that's true. Look, I was up in Seattle when uh, Lasorda went backwards. Oh, on, uh, Bonds uh, brought him the arm sleeve or whatever. I right? saw it. Yeah. I mean, I was right there. It was Ripken's last uh, last All-Star game, and, uh, and he was at third, and A-Rod came in and nudged him over to shortstop. That was so I mean, cool, was, yeah. I was right there to see that. Then he hit a home run, didn't he? Didn't didn't Ripken bomb one after that? Absolutely. 
I was in Houston to see Miguel Tejada win the home run derby. Mm-hmm. And to be in Houston and look at that, the Crawford boxes. I mean, it, just imagine a wall at the end of the bullpen where the bullpen was at the Oracle Park, right, something right. like that. It's like Fenway. So, just jetting out Yeah, there. how about the Fenway moment with Ted Williams and Tony Gwynn yeah. and Mark McGuire when they brought Ted Williams out? That was a, a great moment. You know, it's funny. Uh, until you asked the question, I hadn't really thought through all this, but – I can go through baseball history and come up with moments that that I do remember, and it's really cool, and I'm glad we have it. Yeah. Does it matter who wins, who loses? Not really, and I'm glad that home field is not attached to it anymore. The one thing I would like to see in the game, I know they're going to allow some reentry, I would like to see a pitcher pitch two innings or even pitch three innings. And I realize, you know, you're asking a pitcher to pitch three innings in the middle of the pennant race. You know, it's heresy. You can't do that. And it'll never happen. But there are moments I'd I'd say, gee, I would really like to see this pitcher go two innings and see what he could do to six or seven of the other league's hitters. So would I. So would I. That'd be great. And I don't think they'll let Otani do it, but uh, but it would be great to see a couple of guys maybe. How about Otani? What's going to happen with him? This this is unbelievable. It's unprecedented. It's unprecedented. No, we're coming up to the anniversary of uh, Babe Ruth's first win way back, uh, over 100 years ago. But uh, he was a pitcher. Babe Ruth had 140 decisions, and he won 90, (laughs) something like that. And then he decided to hit 714 home runs. We have never seen anything like this guy. Now, as a Giants connection, we really haven't seen Otani crush the Giants yet or really do anything, you know, to say, wow, he's, he's spectacular. But around the league, he's got 32 home runs. I mean, this is something to see. And plus, he'll pitch. He's going to throw 97 in the All-Star game and then be in the home run derby, too. It's fantastic. It's really exciting. It's going to be one for the ages, especially the derby being in Colorado. Otani's going to be in it. He's got more home runs than any Japanese-born player ever. I mean, this thing is incredible. Well, if they use baseballs. If they uh, use baseballs. They're going to use Super Bowls. They're going to use golf balls, golf balls or Super Bowls. Yeah, <laughs> That's exactly They're going to bring, uh, you know, they're going to bring Dustin Johnson out. I remember seeing him at Oracle. Remember with Dustin Johnson and Matt Kane the night? Matt right, Kane right. pitched the perfect game. I was there. I saw it. Before the game, they were hitting, you know, hitting balls into to McCovey Cove. And uh, they looked like the baseballs at the All-Star game. And uh, it's going to be crazy. And, you know, the home run derby, I think, is for the fans more than anything. If you're there, it's very exciting to see the majestic home runs. To see it on TV after you see the first few, it's to me, uh, you know, I've seen it already. Right, right. <laughs> it's still, it's still going to be exciting, I think, especially for Otani. We're out of time, Marty. It, it is, I mean, we could go all day. We could keep talking home run derbies and all-star games. It's some of my favorite things in all of sports, but specifically in baseball. So uh, we'll talk this weekend. We'll catch up before the game gets going, and then we'll talk next week when I'm in St. Louis for the, uh, the Giants and the Cardinals series. Thanks so much, Marty. Always fun. Anytime. Always good. Thanks. I mean, Marty and I probably could have gone another hour, hour and a half, two hours, 24 hours, whatever you need. When Marty's talking 1933 All-Star Games, he's talking Dizzy Dean foul balls, he's talking Ted Williams broken elbows. Marty can go all day talking baseball. Thank you so much to Marty. Thank you to Brian, and thank you to you, the listener. If you're enjoying the podcast, please rate, review, and subscribe to us wherever it is you're listening. Always fun talking baseball with Marty Lurie, and of course, you can hear him on KNBR every weekend before Giants games. On Monday, we'll stick with the baseball ball theme. How about this? The Futures game Sunday this weekend. Elliot Ramos of the Giants going to be in it as well as Marco Luciano. A couple of the top prospects will talk to the voice of the San Jose Giants guy who has called all of these players both of these players I should say. Joe Rizzo going to join us on Monday. Everybody enjoy the weekend. We'll talk to you then. Baseball's in full swing with fans heading back to the ballpark and a full slate of games every night. Between now and October, things are finally starting to feel a little more normal with America's pastime. The Athletic and BetMGM want to bring you even closer to the game we all love. Right now, listeners of this show can bet $1 to win $100 plus get a free year of The Athletic. You heard that right. Place any $1 bet and get a full year of The Athletic plus $100 from BetMGM when you win. Great sports writing plus extra dollars in your pocket, a total win-win. To take advantage of this offer from The Athletic and BetMGM, go to BetMGM.com slash AthleticMLB. This offer is for new BetMGM customers only, and winnings are paid in bonus dollars. That's BetMGM.com slash AthleticMLB. Visit BetMGM.com for terms and conditions. 
Cue the disclaimer. Must be 21 years of age or older to wager. Colorado, Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, or West Virginia only. Excludes Michigan disassociated persons. Please gamble responsibly. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-522-4700 in Colorado, Nevada, and Virginia. 1-800-270-7117 for confidential help in Michigan. 1-800-GAMBLER in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. And 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa. In Tennessee, call or text the red line at 800-889-9789. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem and wants help, call 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana. Promotional offer not available in Nevada. 